welcome you all to the first eve of uh, the great and holy Passion Week. Um, as a custom, we're going to give the sermon now, but for the younger children, I don't, I don't see very many. They can go to the, their respective classes. Uh, and tonight, every night, we have a special speaker. So tonight, we have uh, Dr. Henry Carlos uh, uh, with us here today um, to give us a homily on the evening theme. Okay, so we'll do just like, a, since it's the first night, we'll do like a brief review. Easy questions. Actually, all I'm going to do is ask a bunch of easy questions. Sometimes it's too simple. It's almost like just read my mind. Don't think too hard about it. And, uh, and then let me know. So it's more interactive because I'm not a priest, so I don't have to be like very formal. So, um, okay. For example, a question will be, why do we fast? And why do we have Pascha? And what does the word Pascha mean anyways? Okay, too many questions. Okay. Let's start even simpler. Why did we close the altar? And why are we praying on this side? Since it's the first day, do the basics. Sorry, what? Okay, so the curtain has a rent in half, etc., like on Good Friday. Okay, anything else? Because they made Jesus leave Jerusalem. Very good. Yeah, and actually, if we look in the Old Testament, you know, in the Leviticus, they have the sin offering, and the sin offering, uh, you know, on behalf of a person or on behalf of all the people, it had to be a sacrifice um, or flour. And then afterwards, they would burn the ashes of whatever sacrifice outside of the city in a specified place. Especially if it was a general sacrifice for sin for the whole people. Then they would burn it outside of the city. And so, of course, Jesus Christ is the same thing. And actually, we have a lot of clarification about this point. Um, in, uh, in the book of Hebrews, the last chapter of the book of Hebrews, chapter 13. But before we get there, just a question again. What is Passover? Sorry. What is Pascha? <laughs> I gave it away. <laughs> Pascha is Passover. Sometimes people think it means passion. And some in some churches, they do talk about passion and passion week. And sometimes we call it passion week. And that's okay too. But even more traditional, and especially in our church, we call it Pascha, meaning Passover. And again, we have the sacrifice spread on the lintel and on the doorposts. That means that the angel of death passed over this house and our Lord Christ is our Passover and he saved us. So he's the sacrifice of sin and he's our Passover lamb. And that's, you know, why we're actually outside of these, of the altar right now, because we are following Christ outside of Jerusalem to his sacrifice. And um, by the way, how do you say sacrifice or offering in Hebrew? I guarantee you know, because you use this word like all the time. After every liturgy, you always say this word. You go and you ask for this thing at the back of the church. Everybody rushes after the end of the liturgy to go and get one of these. Korbana means sacrifice or offering. And uh, I didn't know Arabic growing up, but what does Korbana mean? Hamal, yes. But if you think about it in Hebrew, um, you know, like, mini, get closer to me. Sacrifice, korbana, means getting closer. So, korbana uh, khataya, or khatat in Hebrew. 
So it's the, the sin sacrifice is Orban, getting closer to Christ. Actually, if you have your Bible or your phone, you can open Hebrews chapter 13, the last chapter of Hebrews. And the more that you read this chapter, the more that you find it actually is like instructions for Holy Week, for Pascha Week. So chapter 13, verse 10 and 11. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Again, burned outside the camp. And then this is the key verse, verse 12. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. St. Ephraim, because that's kind of a hard thing to understand, bearing his reproach. St. Ephraim, the Syrian, he said that means bearing the abuse that he endured. So therefore, let us go outside the camp bearing his reproach, like carrying his burden with us also. And it's outside the camp, in, outside Jerusalem. Why is it outside of Jerusalem? Why did it have to be that way? Why couldn't it just have been inside of the altar? Why? It's because God and our Lord Christ is showing us that this sacrifice is for everybody. It's for the whole world. It's not just for those people inside of the law. It's not just for those people inside of the city or, or the priests inside of the altar. It's for everybody. The whole world that this sacrifice happened. So, and then if you continue reading in the, in the chapter, for we are here, for here we are, no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Just like in Pesco week, we are looking for eternal life. We're looking for the next stage. We're looking for the end of the world. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. We are all week praising God. Of course, the doxology over and over again is kind of answering the question that was asked in, one of today's, in a few of today's Gospels. Who do you say that I am? And then we say the response in the doxologies, Thine is the power, right? Over and over and over again. Let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips. That's what we're doing during the Paschal week. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. So he's taking your mind not just inside of church, but everything that you're doing outside of church during this week especially. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. So here we have... St. Paul describing really kind of what Pesca Week is. We're following him outside of the camp. We're singing praises to him continuously. And then we are also obeying and submitting and sacrificing. All those things. Actually, a very nice way when you're reading the scriptures is if you go back and look over whatever little area that you read, just to look at the verbs that are there. So, for example, the verbs in this little passage, go forth, bearing, have, seek. Offer sacrifices, giving thanks, do not forget, do good, share, obey, be submissive, watch. Very specific verbs, verbs that you can really learn from. So I'm going to ask again, why do we fast? Easy question. Self-control. And by the way, almost any answer you give is going to be correct. But this is like read my mind game. So that's good. That's true. What else? Self-control. Why do we fast? Because Jesus fasted. Very good. What else? To give what we love to God. Absolutely. I heard this a long time ago, and I was like, that's exactly right. It was... To be hungry. We fast and we get hungry. Very simple. But also very true. You really need to feel that hunger. You really need to feel that, that need for food. You know, uh, sometimes when we're teaching medical students about something we would call it 
social determinants of health. You guys heard of this weird phrase before? It just means like there are other social things that are involved in people's health. And so one of the things that we teach medical students to ask their patients is, uh, you know, do you have enough money for food? Can you make ends meet, etc. And if a person is hungry, it doesn't matter what you talk to them about. They will not remember anything you talk about. All they can think about is their hunger. All they can think about is the next time they have something to eat. It occupies 100% of your mind. How many of you have felt that sort of hunger? Where you haven't eaten in a day, or two days, or three days? Probably never in our lives. And that's the type of hunger that we want, that we desire for our spiritual, for our spiritual health. This type of hunger, this is the type of fasting that we desire. That we should be so hungry that all we can think about is the bread that we're about to have. That's why we fast. We need to be hungry. And if you're not fasting with that intention, then it's really not a very useful sort of fasting. I remember one time we have a, an uncle named Uncle Nick. He's very famous. Uncle Nick, it's a very famous name. And one time we were having a family get together and uh, somebody brought sorbet. You guys know sorbet, right? It's like the fruit, fruit ice cream. Is very tasty. It's very siami because there's only fruit. But Uncle Nick said, no, I'm not going to have sorbet. Thank you very much. And we said, no, Uncle Nick, it's siami. Don't worry. Everybody's fasting here. It's, it's siami. He said, no, but it's not the right type of fasting if you're having sorbet. Does that make sense? So if you're not fasting with the intention of being hungry, then, you know, why are you fasting in the first place? I'm reminded, actually, of a story in the Bible of somebody that was that hungry. Do you know who I'm talking about? Who was extremely hungry. We actually read it a few Sundays ago. The third Sunday. Very good. The prodigal son. Okay, Luke. It's in the, the lost chapter. Luke chapter 15. Verse 17. But... When he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father's house and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Many years ago, I remember going to a, a Pascha week in a sermon from one of my old Sunday school teachers. And he said, it's a good habit every Passion Week, every Pascha Week, to have one verse that you say over and over and over again. And you can use that verse even for the whole Lent if you, you know, find it in time. And imagine, you know, for the next week, every time you're fasting and you're hungry, you say this verse. When he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's servants have Bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father's house. That's what our fasting should be like. We're, we're so desiring of food, but we remember, God has all the food. He's got the bread that we want. And by the way, if you read in that story, let's keep reading a little bit. He says, and he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him. And had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And that's, he repeated the verse at that point. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He practiced. He practiced praying. So that way when he was finally in front of the throne of God, he could say the verse again. Because he was well practiced. He knew what his thoughts were. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And then God stopped him from finishing even. And actually, if you look in detail here, it also mirrors the story of Pesco week. Because what happened when he came to his father's house? What happened? When he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on him. Outside of the house, just like here, he's outside of Jerusalem. He ran to him. And where did he kiss him? Where did he fall on him? On his neck. Like, of course, obviously, the most intimate sort of kisses on the neck. But more than that, if I go to kiss Abuna's hand, how do I kiss Abuna's hand? I like, I hold his hands with my hands right, and then I, and I kiss his hand. 
right? If you're going to go and kiss your mom on the cheek, you grab her by the face and you kiss her on the cheek, right? How do you kiss somebody on the neck? You have to hug him. There's no other way. For you to be that close, you have to literally have like hug him and be on his neck. There's no other way. It's the same thing that Christ is doing on the cross. Outside of Jerusalem, the father and the son, he ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. It's literally as if he's showing us this is the cross. This is the altar. Now we don't have the altar in Jerusalem. We have the altar that's the cross. And God is dying on the cross. And he voluntarily died on the cross. He ran and fell on his neck. Right? When you see fell on his neck, you also think about somebody dying for this cause. Right? He ran and fell on his neck. And... You know, when you, when you think about an old man, because in the story, what had happened, he'd left a long time ago. And so the father had aged. It had been a long time. And he was daily sitting at the window of his house, watching and waiting for the return, watching for the right time. And when he saw him far, a far away off, then he ran. Have you guys ever seen, like, when I thought of this story, I thought of my dad. And I thought of, well, my dad, maybe what about my giddo? And I remember my Giddo when he was older. What would it be like if you had your Giddo running from like the beginning of the, the door all the way to the gate of the house? It would take all of his efforts, all of his energy. There'd probably be no strength left. All of that effort is exerted just in the, in the pathway there. And then he fell on his neck. That's what God is doing. Everything that he has, he gives in the sacrifice. Absolutely everything. His whole life, he gives in the sacrifice for the whole world outside of the city. Okay, so we fast to get hungry. Then what about why do we have Pascha week? What's the point of Pascha or Passover? This one I gave away earlier too, kind of. What's the point of Pascha week? To be safe from death. So it's not passion, it's not to be suffering, or is it? Pascha means Passover. And the point of Pascha is to pass over into joy. The point of fasting is to be hungry. And the point of Pascha is to pass over from suffering into joy. I'm not saying that we're ending suffering or that we're skip, skipping suffering. We're passing through suffering. That's what Pope Shenouda, Pope Shenouda said. We don't end suffering or give it up. We transform it. And that's what Pascha is. So the whole point of this Pascha week is for us to sit at the foot of the cross waiting, suffering with our Lord, and then going into the joy of salvation. And the church actually is extremely practical. Sometimes when we think about, you know, sometimes you hear talks by theologians and by theology students, and it's like very theoretical and it's lovely. And there's a lot of good stuff there. But then we're like, well, what practically, you know, where do I go from here? And the church here is extremely practical. They're giving you step by step. What do I do? I mean, we started this talk about sacrifice, Christ outside of the cities, but how do I do it? How do I internalize it? How do I tell my heart what to feel? How do I make myself feel grateful, feel appreciative of the sacrifice? You know, St. Andrew of Crete, I guess he's, you know, he's from the Eastern Church. He said, let us run to accompany him as he hastens to his passion. That was his homily for Palm Sunday. Let us run to accompany him as he hastens to his passion. Well, the church is telling us, how do we run with him? And it's telling us from today, it's going to take a few days at least. Let's take at least this Pascha week, this Passover week. Let's start here. You have basically four days. And then we're going to go to the resurrection. Right? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then you got Fridays, like the big day. Like four or five days. And the church suggests that you take all day long. I don't know what time is the morning service at this church probably like 9 to 12 or something like that and then you have like 
Some people do the middle section too in the middle of the day. And then we have the evening service. Some churches have it three times a day. Some churches twice a day. Basically, they want you here all day long. All day on Thursday, liturgy and everything. All day on Friday. And then even all night for Apocalypse Night and then Resurrection. They want you to really focus the next four or five days. And also today, the very first day, our Lord actually is, the church has set it up for us where they have the example of our Lord teaching us what to do. So what happened in the events of today? First thing that happened in the early morning, Palm Sunday, right? Christ enters Jerusalem. And then after that, what happens in church right after Palm Sunday? The funeral service right after. And then after that, he enters into the temple. And right after, at the end of, of today's stuff, it was, who do men say that I am and who am I to you? Palm Sunday, then the funeral, then enter into the temple, and then who am I? Those are the things that our Lord showed us today. Those are the you know quick, quick events of today. And this is the pathway for Holy Week. So the church is giving us a few tips. The first thing is go into Jerusalem. Right? That's what our Lord did first, Palm Sunday. And, you know, when you go and visit the old monasteries in Egypt, the old churches, they have a certain architectural design to the entranceway so that you do something as soon as you enter into the church. What is it? Yeah, they, if you don't know, they have... Usually very small, low doorways with a high step and a short ceiling, as if it's like intended to like knock people out. And the reason is when you enter, you're supposed to like enter very meekly, gently, softly, bowing down your head. So the first thing when we enter into Jerusalem, when we go into the side of the church this Paschal week, is you have to go in with all humility, knowing that this is the place where you're going to be dying. And, you know, the verse that we always are supposed to say when we go inside the church is, As for me, I will come into your house in the multitude of your mercies. In fear of you, I will worship toward your holy temple. Psalm 5, right? And actually, I heard uh, a story from Bishop Abraham. He said that, imagine the donkey that was carrying our Lord Christ into Jerusalem. What if that donkey thought all of this like Hesa and the praises and all the palm branches and the garments and all the clothes that people were throwing in front of the donkey was for the donkey and not for the Lord Christ? It's funny, but it's true. And it's kind of the same thing for us. We're not the star of the show. And when we go inside of the church, we have to bow our heads and go in meekly knowing that this is the place that we're going to be dying and this is the place of our salvation. So the first lesson is we have to go inside of the church with humility. And then, and we know that we're going to be dying. And dying is the humility part. of it. That's our funeral. We die to ourselves and we live in Christ. And then after that, we Christ our Lord enters into the temple. And you know, this story, by the way, is in every gospel. All of the gospels. In the gospel of St. John... Remember that? That's the one where he, he goes in with a whip. And the rest of the Gospels, there's no whip. But he goes and he overturns tables and he sends out everybody. And he says, "This you're making it. This is my house supposed to be a house of prayer, not a den of thieves, not a place for merchandise. And it's the same thing for us. Now we're here in Pesco week. We're inside of Jerusalem. We're dying with our humility. And then Christ is telling us, look inside of your heart. Look closely inside of the temple and take out all those things. There's no buying in here. There's no selling in here. There's no trading in here. You can't be bought or sold in this place. This is not what it's for. It's different. This is a house of prayer. And if you look in your own heart, are you buying and selling and trading? There's a very easy way to know if you open your phone and look at your credit card statement, what are you buying and selling? If you look at your agenda, your calendar of events, what are you buying and selling? Like, what are you spending your time in? What are you spending your money in? Are you trading and buying and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Are you, look at your clothes that you're wearing. 
and you know your your jewelry, etc. Your tattoos. What are they buying? What are they selling? Who are you in business for? Like I could see Abunas are in business. They work for somebody. <laughs> But it's the same thing. When you look at your own heart, you have to know what are you, who are you serving right now? And, you know, honestly, there's a great mystery and irony in Christianity because this is not something that we can buy or attain or somehow qualify for, for this salvation, for this joy. Right? You know, the ironies of Christianity. You know what I mean? To receive, to receive you must give. To become high, you lower yourself. To become the greatest, you must be the least. The ironies of Christianity. To lead, you must follow. To teach, you learn. They persecute us and curse us and spitefully use us and we bless them and we pray for them. They push us away, we embrace them. They throw us down, we lift them up. They spit at us, we give them apostolic kisses. They slap us, we give them the other cheek. They kill the flesh, we live in the spirit. Suffering transforms into joy. If you want to live, you must die. So you have to look in your heart. As our Lord is saying, this is a house of prayer. Not a den of thieves, not a place for merchandise. So, the temple is cleansed from within. And do you make your temple look like, like our church temple? Right? Like when you look around, you have the holy icons that you can see, right? The eyes, the senses for the eyes. You have the incense, the aroma of Christ. You have the hymns. You have uh, reconciliation with God and with man. Basically, the church is using all five sentence, senses. And is your heart filled with those things as well? Just like this holy place. Okay. And again, just practically speaking, if you remember all those verbs from the book of Hebrews, he gives you very specific instructions what you should be doing. You get rid of all that bad stuff, what should you be doing instead? Go forth, bearing, seek, sacrificing, giving thanks, obeying, submission, watchfulness, all those verbs. And then after finally you've cleaned the temple out, you're doing these things, finally we get to the last part of today, the question that our Lord asked us. Who do men say that I am? And then he asked specifically, who do you say that I am? And this is the crux of everything. You are, like our St. Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And this is the fulfillment of all the theology. This is the fulfillment of all of our emptiness, of all our humility. This is the goal. It's really him. He is the goal. And the more that you think about your own weakness, the more you realize how empty you are and how everything focuses on our Lord Christ. That he really is the goal. And that's really sort of all theology comes down to that. We are weak. Christ is good. Christ is strong. We are nothing. Christ is everything. Sometimes, you know, like, for example, you know, you're in a relationship and like you think about like, you know, your love relationship, you and another person or your, your child or, your, or your, your parent. And sometimes you think about, oh, they love me because of this reason for that reason. When the reality is they love because they are a loving person. So in this relationship with us in Christ, it's not about our att attributes that make us lovable. It's about Christ being loving. Does that make sense? And so you have to think less about yourself and more about how amazing our Lord is. I'll give you just one example. I'm basically done. But one example. When I was in college, my roommate was my cousin George. And some family members here, so you guys know. And one day, I was just going to get the mail. I told the story before. And... I was like the mailbox was not the mailbox is like right outside the door sort of mailbox is one of those communities where you had to walk like half a block and they bunched all the mailbox together. So it took like three minutes to go, you know, half a block down and get the mail and come back home. So I was at the door. I was like, Hey, I'm going to just go get the mail. I'll be right back. And George said, I'll come with you. I said, 
it's not that big a deal. I'm just, I'll be back two minutes. I'm just going to go get the mail and I'll be right back. It's like, yeah, but I just want to walk with you. And it had nothing to do with me or my attributes. It was him as a loving person. He was so filled with love that it was overflowing. And that's how Christ our Lord is. He comes, he sees us from afar off. He sees our intentions and he comes and runs to us and falls on his neck for us. So, again, just in conclusion, just to summarize, we are fasting to get hungry, and we have Passover to go through suffering into joy. So that hopefully, when we're at the front of God, when he asks us this question, who do you say that I am? We have practiced the answer, just like the prodigal son, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, making me like one of your hired servants. Any questions? Can you add something to it? Glory be to God. Okay, I'm